Hi class, um, my name's Anne, uh, and I do mediarial Greek theater. Um, I'll just give you a tiny bit of background before I go into my letter. Um, I think she was born in 1913 in New York, um, lived in New York most of her life, um, really loved New York City, and um, anyway, she experienced two world wars, um, World War One and Two, and always thought of her lifetime as the lifetime of the world wars. She also was in Spain during the Spanish Revolution, and that has been, was a significant influence for her. She um, talks about that as when she was born as an artist. Um, so she's an extremely prolific poet, and you could have focused on many things about her. I, for the sake of unity, tried to focus on um, her work as a political actor, her work documenting injustice and um, opposing unjust regimes, um, and her her work as sort of like a, she wrote a lot of biographical poems and persona poems, you could call them persona poems, um, and her work uh, integrating other texts into her text. So there's a lot of other things you could study about her. Um, her, you know, there's, she did a lot on motherhood, she did a lot on bisexuality, she did a lot on the crossover between science and poetry, but I just didn't have time to um, cover everything. So my letter will be, uh, it's going to have a lot of background, so you should probably, you'll be able to understand where I'm coming from once we get to the poem. Dear Ms. Rutazer, I am writing you from the year 2016, 36 years after your death. I am not so different from you. I also grew up in a middle class family and had the privilege to attend a, dip a liberal arts college in New York. Even though you were not the first woman to receive higher education in the United States, and even though you were not the only female poet who garnered national acclaim in the 1930s, your work is so obviously different from your contemporaries. The long poems of your first book, Theory of Flight, defy form and tradition. In Poem Out of Childhood, you are so intent on representing each successive fleeting scene, imagistic language, before hurrying on to the next scene. The only hints of the speaker's opinions are in the colons you use in the middle of your lines to equate each element to the next. In Theory of Flight, you emphatically assert that poetry has a place next to science for its abilities to experiment and find truth. I wonder how this idea that poetry and science are sister disciplines came to you when you were studying at Vassar, among the much more cautious and proper female poets. I wonder what kinds of critiques you endured until you won your first award for theory of flight. I saw a poet say at his reading the other day that he is most concerned with putting disparate things next to each other and letting his reader draw conclusions that may surprise. I wonder if these types of experiments fall under your definition of poetry as next to science, as a discipline that makes new and surprising connections. In your next book, you documented the disaster at Hawk's Nest Tunnel in West Virginia, where miners drilling a tunnel that would have become part of the hydroelectric project became fatally ill from inhaling silica dust from the silica rock that was present in the mountains they were drilling through. You went to West Virginia and interviewed the miners and their families, social workers and doctors who attended to the tragedy. The poems that resulted were in a group called the Book of the Dead and were based on the ancient Egyptian Book of the Dead, a series of incantations that guide the spirit in the afterlife. The focus of these incantations is for the dead to find a way back to speech, to gain a mouth. These poems are spoken in the voices of the miners, of their families, of the company men and the governing officials who helped cover up the disaster. Um, sometimes you move without warning between your lyric and documentary writing within one poem. All of this contributes to what you called poetry's ability to demand an active engagement from the author and from the reader as well. Poetry, you believed, was impossible to ignore which is why part of poetry is witnessing. And you went down to West Virginia to be a witness for all the people who were affected by this tragedy and tried to give them back their mouths. 
your impulse to incorporate found text into the Book of the Dead, your inclusion of, a non, of non-learned elements like the chemical formula for silica, and your use of other voices of collected speech, all of these are elements of a hybrid work, a term that wasn't used to classify poetry until, the ni- until 1982. The t- same term has been used to describe your novel, Savage Ghost, as well, which was called Too Ambitious by your publishers in your lifetime. You lived through two world wars, a failed revolution in Spain, offenses in Korea and Vietnam that the U.S. government will not own up to even to this day. It must have seemed to you like the 20th century was a cursed century. Even with all of its technological advances, the people of the 20th century were doomed to be at war always. You watched Republican Spain fall to a fascist force bolstered by Hitler and Mussolini. In Catalonia, in Republican Spain, I imagine that you saw a collective socialist government where people were more economically and socially equal than they have been than they have ever been in any government that came before or after. Neither the U.S. nor any of the countries of Europe came to the aid of the Spanish, preferring not to join a fight on the same side as communist Russia. You watched Hitler, you watched Hitler execute millions of Jews while the Roosevelt administration worked to keep the United States out of war in Europe by ignoring the Holocaust and covering it up in the media. How could you reconcile the indifference of your fellow Americans with your own passionate belief in freedom and civil rights for all people. How was it to watch everyone around you staying silent? You highlight these silence in the turning wind and the beast in view, and they continue to enter your poems throughout your career. In 1976, you were still writing articles about your experience in Spain, the place where you said you were born as an artist, as a political actor, and as a woman. What is the role of silence in poetry? It's the poet whose witness and mouth, as you proved in your earlier books, how can poets use silence as a weapon? The US government never, the US government never stopped thinking of you as a communist. You were questioned by the FBI and J. Edgar Hoover knew your name and throughout your life, communism and the Soviet Union were still considered the greatest evil the United States faced in the 20th century. The wars did not end after Vietnam. Now the theater of war is in the Middle East, and we have been in, at war for 13 years, our longest admitted war ever. We fight a new post-communist Russia by proxy in another Middle Eastern country, Syria. I wonder what parts of this conflict you would hi- highlight in your work. I wonder what actors in this conflict you would profile in your biographical poems. And I wonder if we should consider ourselves all war poets, having been consistently at war for the last hundred years. You say you lived in the first century of world wars, that it made your days more or less insane. But our country has been at war for 35 out of the last 100 years. It has been in war half my life. But our lives go on anyhow, more or less normally. Maybe what drove your activism, your desire to go to the place of injustice and to witness your lifelong support of labor in your writing, even though it brought you under suspicion by the government. Your refusal to stop talking about what happened in Spain in 1939 was your daily acknowledgement of the insanity of living through world wars. We have lost that acknowledgement of the insanity of war. I wanted to tell you that you have become a feminist icon. Perhaps you already knew this. You wrote, women and poets see the truth arise. Women and poets believe and resist forever. But you also wrote, what would happen if one woman told the truth about her life? The world would split open. I hope to learn from your impulse to witness how to document and how to blend found information with persona and lyricism. I hope to learn how to use poetry to disrupt the social and political norms of our society. Because of your work and because of the work of many female poets and writers of all genres, I think we're coming closer to telling the truth. This is my first poem. It's from US One, published in 1938 when Yu was 25. Um, It's called Absalom. I first discovered what was killing these men. I had three sons who worked with their father in the tunnel. Cecil, age 23, Owen, age 21, Shirley, age 17. They used to work in a coal mine, not steady work, for the mines were not going much of the time. 
A power company foreman learned that we made homebrew. He formed the habit of dropping in evenings to drink, persuading the boys and my husbands to give up their jobs to take this other work. It would pay them better. Shirley was my youngest son, the boy. He went into the tunnel. My heart, my mother, my heart, my mother, my heart coming into being. My husband is not able to work. He has it, according to the doctor. We have been having a very hard time making a living since this trouble came to us. I saw the dust in the bottom of the tub. The boy worked there about 18 months. He came home one evening with a shortness of breath. He said, Mother, I cannot breathe. Shirley was sick about three months. I would carry him from his bed to the table, from his bed to the porch, in my arms. My heart is mine in the place of hearts. They gave me back my heart. It lies to me. When they took sick, right after the start, I saw a doctor. I tried to get Dr. Harless into, to x-ray the boys. He was the only man I had any confidence in. But the company doctor in the copper's mind. He would not see Shirley. He did not know where his money was coming from. I promised him half he would, if he'd work to get the compensation. But even then, he would not do anything. I went on the road and begged the x-ray money. The Charleston Hospital made the lung pictures. He took the case after the pictures were made, and then two or three doctors said the same thing. The youngest boy did not get to go down with, there with me. He lay and said, Mother, when I die, I want you to have them open me and see if the dust killed me. Try to get compensation. You will not have any way of making a living when we are gone, and the rest are going too. I have gained mastery over my heart. I have gained mastery over my two hands. I have gained mastery over the waters. I have gained mastery over the river. The case of my son was the first of a line of lawsuits. They sent the lawyers down and the doctors down. They closed the electric sockets in the camps. There was Shirley, Cecil, Jeffrey, Orrin, Raymond, Johnson, Clev, and Oscar Anders, Frank Lynch, Henry Palk, Mr. Pitch, the foreman, a slim fellow who carried steel with my boys. His name was Darnell, I believe. There were many others. The towns of Glen, Ferris, Alloy, where the rock lies, six miles away, the Netta, Gawley Bridge, Kamaka, Lockwood, the gullies, the whole valley is witness. I hitchhike 18 miles. They make checks out. They ask me how I keep a cow on $2. I say, when we feed the cow, when we the children's flour. My oldest son was 23. My young, next son was 21. My youngest son was 18. They called it pneumonia at first. They would pronounce it fever. Shirley asked that we try to find out. That's how they learned what the trouble was. I opened a way. They have covered my sky with crystal. I come forth by day. I am born a second time. I shall, I force a way through. I know the gate. I shall journey over the earth among the living. He shall not be diminished. Never. I shall mourn to my son. Sorry, that last line is, I shall give a mouth to my son. Okay, here are my notes on the first poem, Absalom. Um, this poem is from a group called The Book of the Dead. This is when Ruth Hazer went down to West Virginia to talk to miners about this mining accident where miners were inhaling silica dust and many of them got sick. And basically, the company was proven to have known about the silica dust and they actually used it to um, they used the silica that they found in the mountain where they were mining for a different project. So they made a profit from all these men dying. Um, the Book of the Dead is a reference to the Egyptian Book of the Dead. This is a set of instructions for um, people who are to do for people who are dead, and they're supposed to help them gain mastery over their body, especially mastery over their mouth, um, basically giving them their speech back. So that is what that means. The title of this poem, Absalom, is a reference to the Bible. Um, Absalom is King David's son who revolted against David and was killed in the revolt. David reportedly was very upset after he learned that he was killed and wished that he, David, had died in his son's place. Uh, this poem is a persona poem. It's written in the first person. The persona is a mother whose three children have died and husband has died of this disease. I'm So it switches off from what I call documentary writing 
to uh, lyric writing. So the short stroke is our lyric, the long stroke is our documentary. So I'm just going to go through some of these notes that I wrote. Um, line six, the homebrew means uh, brewing beer during prohibition. Um, the tunnel, uh, this is the tunnel that they're digging, the Fox Nest Tunnel. Then we get a lyric strophe, then the documentary strophe. Oh, in this lyric strophe, I was kind of confused. I thought, well, maybe this is Shirley talking as well because he says my mother, but after reading the poem a couple of times, I decided that it's just so clearly in the mother's voice that it wasn't, so I don't know what you guys think of that. Um, the last line of this next strophe, line 25, in my arms, um, so he's lost so much weight that she can carry him in her arms like a newborn child. Um, line, then we go back to a lyric strophe, it's still about heart. Um, Line 30, he was the only man I had any confidence in. So that's probably because most of the people who are around work for the company and they were trying to cover this up. Um, he did not, line 33, he did not know where the money was coming from. That probably means that he didn't expect her to pay him and didn't expect her to get compensation for her lawsuit. Uh, line 44, try to get compensation. So Shirley wants his mother to sue the company and get money because he doesn't think she'll be able to support herself without him and his brothers. And I don't know about um, ha women working in the 1930s in West Virginia. I don't know that history, but that is what the poem is telling us, that she wouldn't have been able to work. Then we have another lyrics trophy. Um, this one... It's interesting because it starts out with like body parts, like my heart, and then says she wants to gain mastery of the waters and over the river. So the river could refer to the river that was going to go through the tunnel that caused the death of her son, or the river um, could refer to sort of the river in the Book of the Dead where um, there's a lot of references to the river in uh, the Egyptian Book of the Dead as well, in terms of the dead moving on. Okay, line 63, the whole valley is a witness. This idea of witnessing is something Rue Taser brings up over and over, the poet as witness. Uh, one of the most important functions of the poet is to go witness injustice and, you know, seek it out. Um, Line 73, we learn that because of Shirley's autopsy, they learn what the disease was. Then we have this kind of strange lyric strophe um, starting on line 74. I didn't really know what covered my sky with crystal meant. That could also be taken straight out of the Book of the Dead, but I thought maybe it represented the crystal structure of silica, or maybe like having a Clear crystal ceiling to your sky means that your sky is an endless, like you have limits. Um, or it could mean her sky is beautiful again and sparkling because she was able to make her son's death mean something. Or, or in line 79, as she says, I gave mouth to my son, that is right out of the Book of the Dead. That is like exactly what it says. In many translations, I gave mouth to so-and-so dead person. This is the poem I'm reciting. Uh, it's section 7 of Letter to the Front. To be a Jew in the 20th century is to be offered a gift. If you refuse wishing to be invisible, you choose death of the spirit to stone and slaying. Accepting, take full life, full agony, your evening deep in the labyrinthine blood of those who resist, fail, and resist, and God, reduced to a hostage among hostages. The gift is torment, not alone the still, torture, isolation, or torture of the flesh. That may come also. But accepting wish, the whole and fertile spirit as guaranteed, for every human freedom suffering to be free, daring to live for the impossible. Okay, 
I'm going to go through my notes on Letter to the Front. Letter to the Front was a multi-part poem that was published in Beast in View, um, Lee Kayser's book that came out in 1944, one year before the end of World War II, and um, she was 31. So a lot of the other sections of this poem deal with her experience during the Spanish Revolution, um, and most of them are not as... This is like, this part is a sonnet, so it has a very strict form. Most of them don't have as strict a form as this. Let's briefly talk about the structure. Um, it's a sonnet because it's 14 lines. Most of the lines are close to 10 syllables in length. Usually sonnets have um, iambic pentameter lines, but this doesn't quite have that, but um, I think we would still consider it a sonnet. But it's a Petrarchan sonnet because it's divided into eight and six lines, and then if you look at the rhymes, for instance, in the first four lines, uh, line one and four are rhymed, and line two and three are rhymed. So that is also a Petrarchan sonnet. Um, with sonnets, you can draw comparisons between words that are rhymed. So again, in the first four lines, you can re compare refuse and choose, and century and insanity. I know that century and insanity don't rhyme truly, but that is what we call a slant rhyme. Um, so she's working with a lot of slant rhymes in this. Uh, I think this first section deals with one, this idea of whether Jewish people can be safe by being invisible. So you know that historically in many European cities, um, Jewish people lived in their own neighborhoods, had their own economies. They could exist, you know, they could be invisible to the major population. And is that something that kept them safe? Well, it didn't keep anyone safe during the Holocaust. So I think that's something that she's drawing on here. I also think she's draw. um, I also think that uh, she is making another connection, which is to the fact that for many years while the Holocaust was happening, the media in the United States ignored it because um, the United States was very isolationist and the government did not want to get into war. So I think that idea is also present in this stanza. Um, yeah, so she's saying, don't be invisible. She's saying it's a gift to be Jewish and to be visible. Don't be invisible, but realize that your life will be extremely difficult and full of agony, basically. And then in the second section, so she delays telling us what the gift is. And then the second section, she tells us that the gift is torment, which um, doesn't sound great. Uh, torture, isolation, torture of the flesh. Um, I think by, this is something she does often, she lines up words next to each other, which I think means she's like equating the words, or the second word is like an explanation of the first word, so with torture, isolation, I think that's what she's doing there, and that's interesting to me, because my mind went first to torture, as in torture of the flesh, not to isolation, but um, she explains it for us. Uh... And then the end, the whole and fertile spirit as guarantee for every human spirit, freedom, suffering to be free. So I think what she's saying here is the gift of you're given by being a Jew in the 20th century is that your struggle, your suffering for everyone else, you know, who could possibly suffer under fascist regimes, under any sort of oppression, and so you're suffering for every human freedom. Hopefully your story will be told and this type of catastrophe won't happen again. Something like the Holocaust. Um, that's kind of a hopeful thought, even though it's very sad. And then I think that Ruth Kayser meant she hoped that a genocide like this could not happen again. But... And the last line, she says, daring to live for the impossible, which seems to sort of reverse that, like it's impossible that 
something like this would go away forever. Okay, this is my third poem. It is section three of a multi-section poem called Kata Palwit um, from The Speed of Darkness, 1968. Ruth Hazer was 55 when this book was published. So, can I get my second? Okay. Three. Held among wars, watching all of them. All these people, weavers, carmagnole. Looking at all of them, deaf, the children, patients in the waiting room, famine, the street. A woman seeing the violent, inexorable movement of nakedness, a confession of no, a confession of great weakness, war. It's all streaming to one son killed, Peter. Even the son left living, repeated. The father, the mother, the grandson. Another Peter killed in another war. Firestorm, dark, light has two hands, the pole, this pole and that pole as the gates. What would happen if one woman told the truth about her life? The world would split open. Okay, so here are my notes on this poem. Um, so this is a multi-section poem. It's pretty complicated. It's about a German artist who was born in 1867 um, named Kata Palwitz, and she was... Uh, she did drawings, etchings, lithographs, wood carvings, some painting, and sculpture. And she likes to depict, or she almost always depicts, the poor um, and the effects of poverty on the poor. Sorry, not just the effects of poverty, but the effects of war. Um, she also lived during World War One and World War Two. She was about forty when World War One started, and she died right after World War Two. But um, I've given you guys notes on each of these sections. The ones that are most extensive are the ones on the poem I'm going to talk about, um, but just a brief. So, she, Ruth Hazer is going back to this documentary style, right? Um, this is one thing that she did that we haven't talked about yet. She liked to do biographies of people um, in poetry and also in prose, and so this is kind of like a biographical poem. Um, she, in the first section, says, my life salutes your life or listens to your life. It's because Ruth Hazer thought of herself as having to live between these two wars, and also this artist, Kata Palwitz, did the same thing. Um, the second section includes dialogue, uh, presumably from Palwitz, kind of reminiscent of the um, Absalom poem, the first poem we did, but it's, it's way more integrated than... Um, it's, it's much more seamless than uh, that first one we did, which was, like, sectioned out. You know, it had, like, documentary section and then lyric section. And here everything is kind of, I don't know, it's a lot more put together. Um, so I think that's kind of a change in style. And this is from her later years, and that one was from her early, the first one was from her early years. Uh, let's talk about section three. Oh, the last section. Uh... Ekphrasis is a kind of poetry that is about visual art, and so I kind of see this entire poem as an ekphrastic poem because it's describing Kalwitz's, this entire, you know, five-part poem, um, her method of making art and the way her stuff looks, but um, the last section is called Self-Portrait, and that part I think is most definitely an ekphrastic poem. And read my notes on that because there's some interesting things going on with um, second person and who's narrating it with Ruth Hazer and Kalwitz. Anyway, um, but about section three that I read for you. So uh, line one, held among wars, that means she imagines her lifetime as between these two wars. She can't get away from it, you know, and I think Ruth Hazer felt that way about herself that she could never get past these two horrific wars that she experienced. Um, sorry, uh, sorry, line two, all of them. So this uh, section of this poem, I kind of see it as like a one line and then several responses is the structure. So held among wars, watching all of them, all of these people. So all of them and all of these people are like answers to the first line. Um, Carmenole is 
a song that was popular during the French Revolution. I provided the text and the document. Take a look at it, it's pretty. Um, anyway, <laughs> line six. Uh, okay. Lucas are the lines up these nouns as if they're equivalents. So the way that this is structured, like, would be one line and then response, and like the response is all justified in the same place. I think she's lining these things up to be equivalents. So like, death is equivalent to the children, and patience is equivalent in the waiting room is equivalent to famine, which is strange because death and famine are in concrete. We can't actually see those things when we go outside but we could see the children if we wanted. Um, and then in the next strophe, uh, she starts describing Kalwitz and her process, the way she went through the war, the way she saw the war and depicted it. Um, then Kalwitz's son was killed, and in line 18, when she says, even the living son repeated, I think she's referring to the fact that her living son's son was then killed in World War II, so he was also named Peter. So history repeats itself. You know, this whole poem is about how these two wars are never going to go away. Like, they always, since the memory is so crazy and ever-present for these women, it's just, they're not going to be able to get away from it. Um, and then... Final line, or the final strophe, what would happen if one woman told the truth about her life, the world would split open. That's probably one of Ruth Bader's most famous lines. And um, just for the feminist movement especially, but also I think the word split is kind of like she's playing with that word because the world kind of already split open because of World War One and World War Two. Um, I also provided some examples of Kalwitz's art, um, especially the pieces mentioned in the fifth poem, so those are up with the document.